As we bow together this morning and look to the Lord in prayer, I want to uh, remind you to be praying for Faye Luttrell today. Clyde texted me just right before the service that he's there at the nursing home with her, and she is not doing well today. So we want to remember them today as we pray. Also pray for Bob Goins' mom who is in the hospital with COVID pneumonia and some other issues that they've had to uh, seek out an oncologist to come and do some tests with her as well. So remember Ms. Goins and, and I know you pray for Retha many times and Retha Lancaster and uh, just every day Retha deals with a headache and uh, just has a lot of issues with that. So keep her in your prayers as well and Margie and, and let's continue to pray for them and others. If you'd like to join us, you're welcome at the altar always. And if you'd like to be seated where you are, let's bow together our hearts and our minds and look to the Lord today. We love you, Lord. We lift our voices to sing to you and to worship you. We want you to know how much we love you and how much we count it a joy to be the children of God. We thank you for loving us with such incredible, incredible love. Your love never fails. Your love never ends. And so we celebrate today and how great the love of God is that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. And that's what you've called us is children, sons, daughters. We are joint heirs with Jesus. You've invited us to come boldly into the throne room of grace. We can come before you and cast all of our cares and our burdens and our needs and know that we have a God who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all we could ever hope, think, or imagine. Lord, I just pray that in this service today, you would be glorified. We worship you. We lift you up. You are an awesome God. In you, we live and we move. We have our being. Without you, we can do nothing. And nothing is too difficult for you. So we find our help and our hope in you. We trust in you. We lean on you. And Father, I just pray that you would move across these aisles and touch every heart in life. I pray that you would go to those who are worshiping with us online, wherever they may be today. May they sense your nearness, your presence, your love for them in a special way. Father, we do lift up to you today, Miss Faye. And she's gone through a lot these last several years. And Lord, I just thank you for Faye. What a precious, wonderful lady. And I just ask God that you would draw very near to her and be her help today and her strength. Walk alongside Clyde today and give him peace and understanding that you're there. You're ministering to them. We pray that you'd be with Miss Goins today, Lord, that you would raise her body up, that you would bring healing and strength to her, touch her in a brand new way. Father, I pray that you would just move all of these headaches and the problems that Retha has where she would have strength and she would have your touch. I pray that you would comfort Brother Bill and Retha Thank you for them and the many, many years they have served you so faithfully and been a blessing and are a blessing. Continue to touch them. And Father, be with Margie today. Wrap your arms around her. Help her, Lord, to breathe and have strength in her life. There's others in our church family and beyond, ones that our people are praying for right now, for loved ones that... You know those life situations. You know those needs. And so, Lord, we agree together concerning those needs that you would touch 
each one of them. That you would speak your presence, your healing, your provision into each need that's represented today. What an awesome and a wonderful privilege it is that we can just lay all these burdens at your feet. The Bible tells us that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. And so nothing that's formed against us can prosper because we are the children of God, the people of God. So I pray that today we would have a renewed strength, new faith, new direction. And Lord, we would see you high and lifted up. We would experience you in a new, fresh way. Have your right of way, we pray. And Father, when we come to the end of this service, we will step aside and ascribe unto you the glory, the honor that's due your name, the wonderful, the mighty name, the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, when you pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Let us affirm our faith today in uh, reading together and declaring together the Apostles' Creed. This is what I believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the church universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 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 We're the people of God.
they do. Are you singing a solo? Good to see everybody here today, and uh, <clears throat> I was told to announce to you, choir members, um, you're going to have to stay till the end of the sermon today, <laughs> because they need to see you right down here to my right, right after the service this morning. So choir, if you'll jump down here for a moment. And no, you can't do it right now. You'll have to just wait. <laughs> so there's a lot of announcements in your bulletin. There are dates to remember, and uh, you need to mark those dates on your calendar. Next Sunday is time change, and uh, so we're going to fall back uh, it's next Saturday night. And uh, so there's all kinds of uh, outreach events and things uh, leading up into the Christmas season. Is it not just impossible to believe it's already time? But it is. So um, those of you who may not be participating in, uh, in Faith Promise, uh, Thanksgiving offering is a great time to... Uh, a give towards world missions. That's historically uh, Easter and Thanksgiving, great times to give towards missions. Uh, or if you want to give extra or catch up in your faith promise, that's a great time to do so. And uh, uh, there's announcements in the, on the bulletin board out there concerning crisis care kits and opportunities to support Samaritan's Purse and, and uh, Big Oak Ranch. We're also going to, again, uh, uh, support the Salvation Army Angel Tree. There will be angel trees, again, in the back of the sanctuary, and you can pick up a name and purchase those gifts, bring them. And uh, we had a great response last year. Thank you to everyone that participated in that. So we're looking forward to uh, another great time this year to bless 20 children at least in our area, with uh, Christmas gifts. And uh, so also if you are a staff, a teacher, board member, committee member, you're invited to a workers' appreciation Christmas dinner on December the 16th at 530. Ladybugs, you know what a ladybug is? It's not these little red bugs we have get in here once in a while. It's all you ladies. You're the ladybugs. So you've got an event coming up on December 2nd on Friday night. So mark that down on your calendar at 5 o'clock. Lots of exciting things happening on. Be a part of all of those. And make this an opportunity this season to invite loved ones and family members and friends to come and worship with you and get acquainted with us so that they will find a church home and enjoy it just like we hope you're enjoying it. And so God bless you. We're going to ask our ushers, if they would, to come and wait upon us this morning for the Lord's tithes and our offerings. And God bless you in the faithfulness of your giving. If you are online, we invite you to go to our website at hsvsenaz.org and click on the Give tab. And you're able to give on a, in a very safe manner, a safe platform of your tithes and offerings and uh, to support the work of the church. And God bless you in your giving. Would you join me as we pray together?
Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give. What a gift and a joy it is to be able to give back to you. For you have given so much to us, and so from the great supply and the resources of your hand into ours, we take back and give to you that portion to bless you. We thank you, Lord, and bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Join me in looking in the New Testament to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans the 8th chapter. And we're going to begin to read at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints 
according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. I want us to focus this morning on that 28th verse of Romans chapter 8. Very familiar, favorite passage of scripture for many people. But to begin this morning, I want to tell you a story that hopefully will help us kind of understand better what this verse of Romans 8, 28 really means. The story begins in 1921. There was a young missionary couple named David and Zvia Flood who went with their two-year-old son from Sweden all the way to the heart of Africa to what was then called the Belgian Congo. And there they met up with another Scandinavian couple, the Ericsons, and soon these four missionaries felt led by the Lord to move out of the central mission station and take the gospel to one of the more remote areas of the Congo, an area that had not been evangelized. And there they found themselves at a little village called Indalera. And there in that village they were rebuffed by the chief who would not let them enter his town for fear of alienating their small g gods. So the two couples decided that they would go about a half a mile on away from this village and there they would build their huts. They prayed and prayed for spiritual breakthrough to come to this village of Indalera. But there simply was no sight of a spiritual breakthrough coming. Their only contact with the villagers was a young boy who was allowed to come to their uh, little huts outside of their area and sell them chickens and eggs twice a week. Missionary Svi of Lud uh, was a little tiny woman, only four feet, eight inches tall. And she decided that if this one little African boy was all she could talk to, then she was determined that she was going to teach him about Jesus and lead him to know Jesus. And in fact, over a period of time, she succeeded. But there were no other encouragements, no other signs of uh, any kind of a spiritual breakthrough. Only this one little African boy. Meanwhile, malaria struck one member of their little group after another. And in time, the Ericsons, they decided that they had had all the suffering that they could handle. So they packed up and they returned to the Central Mission Station. And then in the middle of this primitive wilderness, Svea found herself now pregnant. And when the time came for her to give birth, the chief of the village, he softened a little bit and allowed her to have a midwife to help her. And a little girl was born. And they named her Aina. A-I-N-A, you can call it Aina, Ina, however you want to say it. The delivery was very difficult for her, and she was already sick from malaria, and the birth process was a very heavy blow to Svea's body, and she only lived 17 days and died. 
inside missionary David Flood, something seemed to snap in his heart and his mind. He went out and dug a very crude little grave, and there he buried his 27-year-old wife. He took his children back to the central mission station, and he gave this newborn daughter of his to the Ericsons, the other missionary couple. And to them, he snarled, and he said, I'm going back to Sweden. He said, I've lost my wife. I obviously can't take care of this baby. God has ruined my life. And with that, David Flood left, rejecting not only his calling, but rejecting God himself. Now, I want you to understand that it is true. Sometimes tragic things happen even in the lives of those who seemingly walk the closest to the Lord. But bad things do happen to good people. And that is just where this passage of Scripture of Romans 8, 28 comes in to give to us in these times these tragic experiences, it comes to give us a message of hope and encouragement and to assure us that in all things, not some things, not just a few things, but the Bible says in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Now, the Bible did not say everything that happens in your life is going to be good. That's not what the Bible says. Don't get believing that you're going to get saved and everything's just going to go hunky-dory. That's a good word you need to know, hunky-dory. And just everything's going to go, you know, perfect in your life. That's not what we're promised. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. There's going to be bad things that happen. There's going to be tragedy in our lives. We are not guaranteed that we're not going to suffer or have to sacrifice in this life. Sometimes we get saved, set on our spiritual haunches, and think we're just going to be, you know, God's favorite the rest of our lives, and there's nothing going to touch me. That's not true. That is simply not true. But God still promised That even though these things happen, in all things God works for the good of those who love him, for those who have been called according to his purpose. Now the very next verse, verse 29, it tells us what God's purpose is. And it says, for those that God foreknew... Those he predestined, what? To be conformed to the likeness of his son. That is God's purpose for your life and for mine. Even in the midst of tragedy, when things are going against us, it seems like, God's purpose for our lives is to be conformed to the likeness of his son. You need to highlight that. You need to circle it. You need to put an exclamation point and say, this is God's purpose for me, to be conformed to the likeness of his son. Do we understand what that means? It means that God is working through everything that happens in the lives of those who love God. God is working in everything to help us become more like Jesus. No matter what the problem, no matter what your heartache may be, if we love God and if we will let God have his way, then even the problems we face in this life can be a glorious part of this process. What process? To be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. I want us to look at three specific blessings that can come into our lives 
through problems. In all things give thanks. Isn't that what the Bible says? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you in all things. That means we need to be thankful for the problems. How long has it been since you said, oh, God, thank you for this problem. It's a blessing to me. I never get a phone call any time in my life from any member that has ever said to me, oh, I'm having such bad times and I'm so thankful for it. No. But there are blessings that come into our lives through problems. And as we see how God uses problems in the past to bring about great blessings, then it will help us in the problems that we face today. First thing, now there is a great spot for you on the back of your bulletin to write some of these things down because you're going to get home and say, man, I wish I'd have listened and uh, wished I could remember that. The first thing I want you to understand is God uses problems to direct us and to shape us. God uses problems to direct us and shape us. We need to understand that. The difficult things that happen in your life and in mine, big, small, whatever they are, they are not some random freak accidents or streaks of bad luck. They are allowed and at times even orchestrated by God. Try that one on for size. Problems, events that we have are either allowed by God for nothing can touch you as a child of God. Nothing can touch you that has not first passed through the hands of your heavenly Father. And if God says it's okay, then he's going to give you all you need to get through that situation. He's got grace. He's got strength. He's got provision. He can do the miraculous. So all of these things that happen, he uses problems to direct us and to shape us because he wants us to be conformed, to be shaped, to be fashioned into the image of Jesus. Picture a large rock in the middle of a barren field and sitting there by itself, it looks like an ordinary overlooked without much use rock. But you put that rock in the hands of a master sculptor and it can become a masterpiece. And our lives are a lot like that rock. Even though you can't see it right now, God is busy creating something breathtaking in your life. And through everything you've endured, even the confusing situation you might be facing with now, God is working in you to conform you into the likeness of Jesus. The problem is, as it's happening to us, we can't always see it. We can't understand it. All we see is chips of rock flying when God is trying to shape us and fashion us, and the chisel's blow isn't evidence that God has left us or is angry with us, but rather that God is right in front of us, eyeing our progress, smoothing the rough edges, and patiently bringing the image of Jesus out in us. God is working on us. The Bible says, count it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Again, I would tell you, I have sat through 40 years plus of uh, testimony services, and I've never heard anybody just stand up and give God glory for these trials of life. But the Bible says, that we ought to have joy and be thankful when we face many trials because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work 
so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. So God uses problems and trials and situations to shape us, to conform us into the image of his son Jesus so that we may be mature. You see, Jesus doesn't want just a whole bunch of baby Christians running around. He wants us to grow up in the faith. And I know some people that's gotten a little white in the temples that still haven't grown up in the faith. They're still back here on the foundation things, the ABC principles of the gospel. When Jesus has wanted us to become mature and grow into completion and maturity in the spiritual life. Trials of many kinds. That's what we're talking about. Events that are either allowed or orchestrated by God. Why? To shape us into the image of Jesus. And we're not going to get around it. We're going to go through it. But he's going to go with us through it all. Amen? And it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be comfortable. God didn't promise that. So we need to get off of that that bad thinking. And why does God do this? Because James 1 tells us he does it to complete us, to mature us, to bring us into a mature, walking, understanding life as a Christian. So God uses our problems to direct us and shape us. Secondly, God also uses problems to correct us. Sometimes we may be stuck in a rut. And God uses problems to change our direction in life. It's not necessarily that we're doing anything wrong. It just may be we need a new direction. And so God will allow problems to come into our lives to give us a mid-course correction and to help change our lives. But there are other times when we've definitely done wrong. We've strayed into sin and we need correction. His discipline in order to have, he disciplines us in order for us to be in fellowship and to be restored to him. So God will use some problem in your life and in mine to stimulate us to think about the sin that we may have fallen into so that he can help to correct our behavior. Think about the story of the prodigal son. In uh, Luke 15, we see in verse 13 this prodigal son. He, you know this story as well as I, how he set off for a distant country and there he squandered all his wealth and wild living. And after he had spent everything there was, then there came a famine in that whole country, and he was in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him out to feed his pigs. And he even longed that he could fill his stomach with the, with the pods that the pigs were eating, but nobody gave him anything. So here he had all this money, and he went out in riotous living and lost it all. And he's hungry, and he's out feeding pigs. That's pretty low for a Jew, right? So when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? In other words, there's people that's got it better. These pigs, he's saying, has even got it better than he had it in his life. He said, here I am starving to death. But he said, I will arise and go back to my father. And I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. Now, the problems when they got to be too much for him, he began to allow God to correct him and motivate him and stir him into action to go back to his father where he had all that he needed. And when he came to his father, 
He didn't just slide in the back door. No, he admitted his sins. He confessed them and he repented of them. And he turned his steps towards home once again. By the way, do you realize that when we deliberately stray from what we know is right, that God has promised to correct us? In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, the Bible says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. So God will correct you. He will send you uh, information and warning that you need to turn. You need to go back to the Father and find forgiveness. And can I tell you, when you come back to him, he will in no wise cast you out. It doesn't matter if you've come 100 times. You come 101 times. He's the God of the second chance. Amen? Amen. God knows how devastating sin can be. And when we will yield our lives to him, he's promised to correct us. So when we're having problem after problem, maybe we need to stop and ask God, what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to show me? I had a young guy years ago, he, he came to my door one day to the parsonage and knocked on the door and I opened the door and there he was. I didn't see him an awful lot um, at church, but here he shows up at my door. And he just hands this, or more like shoves this tithe check. I've had more tithe checks shoved at me for different reasons. And I never refuse it. But this guy shoved this tithe check in my hands. He said, here. I said, what do you want me to do with this? He said, you got to do something with this. He said, because he said, I've had everything in my life going wrong, and I'm going to catch up with God, and I'm going to get right with God, and I'm starting with my tithe. Boy, it's not a bad place to start, amen? amen. I mean, you want to be on praying ground? Be a faithful tither, right. amen? amen? Don't shout me down, church. It's only Sunday morning, and it's still true whether you acknowledge it or not. So he said, everything's going wrong. i got to pay my tithe so God will get off my back. Well, I don't know if God got off his back, but I did take the tithe check. When we go through these problems, we say, God, what are you, what are you trying to show me? Is there something I need to learn here? So God will use those problems to direct us and shape us. He'll also use problems to correct us. But he also will use problems to protect us. He will use problems to protect you. It was on the event of Dana's Papa's 100th birthday. And she in Austin, who was just a baby... She and Dana and Austin were getting in the car, had the car already packed on a Wednesday evening. We're driving from West Texas to Gainesville, Florida, by themselves, just the two of them. Brianna and I stayed home. And I was at the church in meetings that Wednesday early evening. And she calls me and she says, you got to get home. Austin's already sitting in the car. The car's packed. I'm ready to leave. She was going to drive as long as she could through the night because if she could get me and the kids asleep, she could make some miles. If I'm awake or the kids are awake, we don't get anywhere. So anyhow, she said, would you please come home? The car will not start. I said, it's a brand new Suburban. Why will a brand new Suburban not start? That's just ridiculous. I didn't buy a new car so it wouldn't start, but it wouldn't start. I said, okay. So I left my meetings, and I went home. Austin's still sitting in, the, in his car seat, in the, in the back seat, ready to go. And she's patiently, impatiently pacing back and forth. So anyhow, I go in the garage where I knew I had two sets of jumper cables. They're not there. How can they not be there? That's where they go. 
So I went out to the shed out in the backyard, looked all through there. I thought, surely I must have put them out there. They're not there anywhere. Austin's getting more restless. She's not getting real blessed. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? And this car will not start. I can't find jumper cables anywhere. We hadn't lived there very long, and I didn't know all the neighbors, but I'm canvassing that neighborhood, knocking on the doors. You thought I was a Jehovah's Witness. I'm knocking on the doors, and I, 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 nobody answered the door. I'm like, well, where are these crazy people? Not one soul answered the door. I went back to the house. I said, forget it. Take Austin out of the car. He can't go. I said, I don't know what to tell you. So she unloads everything, goes back in the house. I go back to the church. People are just pouring in, saying, have you heard? Have you heard? Have you heard? And I said, heard what? We're maybe a mile, two miles from the interstate. They said right on the edge of town was this massive wreck involving many, many cars right there at the entrance to I. 20. It is 20, right? I 20. Right there where you get on. All these cars, it blocking the whole interstate. And that's exactly where she and he would have been if that car had started. God uses problems to protect us. Think about Joseph in the Old Testament. Joseph was the favorite son. And as a result of his favoritism, his brothers got very angry and bitter at him. They were just so upset with how he was, oh, he's just like my older brothers have always said to me, oh, he's the favorite, he's the baby. And so Joseph, I mean, it's, you can't help when you're falling into the right spot. And, and so Joseph, he's hated by his brother so much so that when a caravan comes on their past there, on their way to Egypt, they sold him. No, Brianna, you cannot sell your brother. <laughs> they sold him. And one minute he's the favorite son, the next he's in chains being sold into slavery. It seemed like life couldn't get any worse for Joseph, but God had a purpose and a plan for his life. And I'm not going to take the time to get into all of his life. You know his life story. And you know how that it just seemed to get bad and worse every time he turned around until he's in prison. But then God, who still knew, His son was in prison, and the one he's going to use. And God had prepared this moment. And so he had Joseph lifted up to a new place of authority. And he was the second most powerful man now, next to Pharaoh. And here comes this horrible time of severe famine. And Joseph encounters his brothers again, but they didn't know it was their brother that they had sold. And so finally Joseph revealed himself to them, and when his brothers realized that that was Joseph that they had sold into slavery, man, they are scared to death. And he could have said, all right, suckers, it's time to get even. But he didn't. He saw the hand of God. He recognized that God uses problems to protect us. And so it was that now he, the most second most powerful man, he said, don't be angry with yourselves. Don't, don't feel bad for selling me and me winding up like I did. Because he said, God did it all to save lives, and God sent me ahead of you, and we're going to be all right. 
And so he gave them all the grain and the things that they need. He said, you meant it for evil, but God uses problems to protect us. And so God turned it around for good. So you see, we must learn to trust God even when problems come because he will use those problems to direct us and shape us, to correct us, and to protect us. For he has promised that all things will work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Now, go with me back. To the beginning story of David and Svea Flood. Eight months later, after David had left his children with the Ericsons, the Ericsons, eight months later, were stricken with illness and both died within days. The baby was turned over to some other mission, uh, American missionaries, and they adjusted her name to Aggie for Agnes. And eventually, they took her back to America. And as a young woman, Aggie attended North Central Bible College in Minneapolis. And there she met a young man named Dewey Hurst, and the Hurst would enjoy many years of fruitful ministry. Dewey Hurst also became a president of a Christian college in the Seattle area. And one day at their home, a Swedish religious magazine somehow, don't you love how it just somehow appeared in her mailbox. She had no idea how this Swedish a Christian magazine wound up in her house, but it did. And so she began to look at it, and she couldn't read the words, but she turned the pages and looked, and there was a photo that caused her to just stop still in her steps. For there she saw a picture of a little crude grave and a white cross that her dad had built on her mother's grave back in 1923. Aggie jumped in the car. She went straight to the college because she knew there was a professor there that could interpret this story for her, and he did. And uh, he summarized the story about it being about missionaries who had come to Indalira long ago and the a birth of a white baby and the death of a young mother and only one little African boy who had been led to Christ and about how the whites had all left and the baby had grown up and finally persuaded the chief to let him build a school in the village. The article said that gradually this Young, black, African boy began to win other students to Jesus Christ. And the children led their parents to Jesus Christ. And even the chief of Indalera had become a Christian. And today there were 600 Christian believers just in that one little village when there was no one being saved when the missionaries were there. But that's not the end of the story. For the Hearst's 25th wedding anniversary, they were given a gift of a vacation in Sweden. And there Aggie went to find her father, her birth father, and meet her. She knew that he had later married again and fathered four more children. And he had suffered a stroke. He, he turned his heart so cold and hard against God that he, he became an alcoholic and he was literally just shriveling up and dying. And he warned everybody around him, never mention to me the name of God. And he would just come out in a rage and an anger if anybody talked about God. Well, she found her dad and she said, Papa, it's me, your little girl. And he said, Ena, I never meant to give you away. And she said, it's all right, Papa. She said, God 
took care of me. He said, don't you mention God to me. Don't talk about God. He failed us. He forgot all about us, and our lives were ruined because of God. Don't talk to me about God. And she stroked his face, and she loved on him, and she said, Oh, but Papa, let me tell you a story, and it's a true story. She said, Papa, you did not go into Africa in vain. She said, Mama did not die in vain. She said, that little boy that you all won to the Lord all those many years ago, she said, that little boy grew up and he became a Christian and an evangelist. And the seed that you planted in that one little boy today in Indalera are 600 baptized Christians in that little village, even the chief. She said, Papa loves you. Jesus loves you. He's never hated you. And so he began to soften up. Tears formed in his eyes. And she was able to pray her dad through to salvation. And he came to know Jesus after so many years. Well, years later, the Hearst were attending an evangelism conference in London, England. And a report was given from the nation of Zaire, the former Belgian Congo. The national leader of the church there, representing some 110,000 Christians, representing 32 mission stations and Bible schools and a 120-bed hospital, he began to speak eloquently of the gospel's spread in his nation. And Aggie couldn't help but wonder, did he know of her mom and dad, the missionaries? So as soon as he got through preaching, she went straight to him and she said, have you by any chance ever heard the names David and Svea Flood? He said, oh, oh, yes, yes. He said, it was Svea Flood who led me to Jesus Christ. I am the little boy that they won to Jesus. And you see, all because they planted a seed. God didn't fail them. Tough things happen. Problems come. God uses those problems to direct us and to shape us. God uses problems to correct us. And God uses problems to protect us. I need you to know that in all things, God works together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? To bring us into conformity, to shape us, to bring us into this place of living like Jesus. It's not that we'll have this cushed life, but it's that we will be conformed to the image of his son Jesus. That's the purpose. That's why God gives us grace and help and supply and even problems. Because in all things, God is still faithful. God had a plan when those missionaries went there. And God's plan came to fruition. Maybe not as it was originally planned, but God saw that seed in that little African boy and used him to do incredible things for the glory of God. We know that all things will work together if we'll let God have his way. Father God, we thank you today for the truths, the power of your word. We thank you, Lord, that if we would just turn our lives over to you and let you have your way, 
Oh, we're going to have problems. We're going to have troubles. But like the song says, if I didn't have a problem, I wouldn't know God could solve them. I wouldn't know what faith in God could do. But if we'll just trust God and let God have his way and live for God, then through every trouble, every trial, every heartache, every reverse, every situation, God is going to work together for good, for the glory of God. Thank you, Lord. Help us today to just turn our troubles and our problems over to you. Help us to bring to you our lives and say, Lord, I've made a mess out of it. Would you correct my life? Would you change my life? Would you start anew and afresh in me? Make me like you want me to be so that we can sing together that through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. I've learned I can depend upon God's holy word and he'll never fail us nor forsake us. You said as you were with Moses, so you'll be with us. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. And so we go in your strength and in your power. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus, and I've learned to trust in God. Through So I encourage you today to walk with God and he will be your dearest friend wherever you go and in everything you do. And may your life reflect his love to everyone and walk with God and he will walk with you. Shall we stand together, shake hands, be friendly. You are dismissed. Choir, if you'll join us down here at the front.